Hi guys, in today's video I just wanted to take a little bit of time talking about some games that really surprised me on Sega platforms, primarily the Saturn and the Dreamcast. And now, of course, I'm going to look for games and I'm purchasing games. They're games that I am looking for because I'm intending to like them, games that appeal to me for some reason. But there are certain games that really blew past my expectations, games where I went in thinking I was going to enjoy them, but I ended up enjoying them much more than I originally anticipated. The first one is going to be Machin X on the Dreamcast, and without knowing a whole lot about this game, I first picked it up because I saw the, of course, the Sega logo on the bottom, turned it around, saw the Atlas logo on the bottom there, and saw a lot of the very obvious Shumigami Tensei style artwork, and absolutely had to have it without really knowing a whole lot about it, and it is a first-person action game that plays, in a way, a lot more like your typical third-person hack-and-slash, but from a first-person perspective, which at first was a little hard to get used to. I was terrible, it took me maybe five, ten tries to get past the first level, but once I did, once I sort of got a hang of it, I really started enjoying this game and really got into it, and even though the game itself did get more difficult as time went on, as you got more used to the control scheme and just the style of the gameplay, it actually got a little bit easier as it went along for me, just from getting used to it. And I really, really enjoyed it, and that initial thought of, I'm not sure if I can really get used to this completely different style of gameplay, quickly dissipated and turned into one of my favorite experiences on the Dreamcast. Now, a series that I've always had some interest in, and have been kind of avoiding the English language anime releases because I wanted to experience the games first, is definitely Sakura Tyson, the uh, Sakura Wars over here in the U.S., and I was really looking forward to playing them, knew that they were going to be a little bit harder to get into until my Japanese got a little bit better, and didn't really decide to get into the series until I started to do this idea of a summer of Sega, and said, you know what, now's the time to really get into those games that I've been putting off really looking forward to getting into. And I actually started with three on the Dreamcast, and this so far is the only one I've uh, beaten so far. I went through and played this and I played it without any help of a translation guide or anything, and I want to play it again before I do a review um, with a translation guide, just to sort of help pick up little, seconds, uh, little segments that might have been a little too tough for me, or maybe I misinterpreted it with, you know, not being able to read a certain phrase or something, you know, that type of thing where reading level is good enough that I can get through it, but maybe not good enough where I can catch everything for the game. So really, really enjoyed it much more than I thought. It was different than I thought. It actually was a little bit heavier on the dating sim and the sort of just dialogue interaction options than on the RPG elements. And that wasn't a bad thing. It was just more swayed that way than I was expecting. And it actually preferred that way. I think it really fits that style, and it's a really good series so far. And I've picked up three. I picked up one on the Sega Saturn, the original version, not the Dreamcast version, and four on the Dreamcast so far. So looking for two and all the spin-offs and stuff like that, of course. Uh, really serious, and I'm really now very much looking forward to getting more into as I enjoyed three tremendously. The next two are two Dreamcast survival horror pickups, Carrier and Blue Stinger on the Dreamcast. And these are both similar in that they are both survival horror, but a little more towards the cheesy side than the scary side. Think of the original Resident Evil. I mean, they don't have the beautiful FMV uh, intro that, that has, but they both have that sort of over-the-top B-movie horror appeal to them, while still being great action games, still being really good horror games, and that they have a few like jump scare moments, a few spooky moments, but overall are more of gruesome fun in a way, and Blue Stinger I think definitely goes a little more towards the action side and a little more towards the humor side than Carrier, which sways a little bit closer to the actual horror side between the two. Um, but I enjoyed them both equally, um, even for their oddities. I mean, Blue Stinger has some pretty terrible controls until you really get used to it, and even then the camera's a little wonky. Uh, Carrier suffers a little bit from having sort of that old-school Resident Evil sort of tank control style, but in all honesty, I actually really enjoyed Carrier's control scheme once I got used to it and liked it better than the first handful of Resident Evils as far as the controls. The overall story and atmosphere was not as good as those, but Carrier was a lot of fun and really surprised me because I was really looking at it as being sort of a, alright, you know, play Code Veronica and different things like that, looking for more of that style game on the Dreamcast, and Carrier was going to be okay, 
but it actually surprised me. It had some really good puzzles. The story was more interesting than I thought it was going to be, and it was a, a horror game that I would definitely suggest checking out for the Dreamcast. Uh, definitely one that exceeded my expectations. Uh, Blue Stinger, not quite as much as Carrier, but at the same time, I knew more about it going in, so I had a better idea of what I was getting into. And this one is more of the has more of the fun factor. Carrier is one I think is more interesting to play, sort of alone in the dark. Blue Stinger, I think, is actually something that could be more fun with a friend in the room passing the controller back and forth, and have it. It has more of that B movie quality in Carrier. The next one is the Sega Saturn port of Warcraft 2, and growing up in the 90s. I played the hell out of Warcraft 2 and the expansion set on our old Power Mac and then eventually on our first you know, Windows PC and absolutely loved it. I was so addicted to it. I started with the original Warcraft and was just blown away by the improvements between Warcraft Orcs and Humans and Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness. I mean, if you, if you grew up playing those in that order, you know what I mean. The, the improvements were spectacular between those two and I really enjoyed it. And there are actually even a few elements of Warcraft 2 that I felt were missing from Warcraft 3 overall, really enjoyed it. So playing a console port, I really wanted to give it a try, but my expectations were low. And obviously, Warcraft 2 on the console is not going to be anywhere near the caliber of the home computer release. And it's, and it's not. But this is actually a pretty decent port and was better than expected. I mean, sadly, it does not have mouse support, but in a weird way, as I got used to it, I didn't find using the controller to be all that bad. It was not as bad as I thought. It is missing definitely some sound effects. Graphically, it's not quite as good. But it has all the levels from Warcraft 2 and the expansion set. And you're getting the majority of the experience just at a slightly lower caliber version. But overall, it's a lot of fun. It's a great to just be able to throw into a console and be able to play it and really have it not be just completely hindered by the new control scheme. It's something to get used to, but it's really not a bad port. And I actually enjoyed this. I played the PS1 port before this, and I did enjoy the Saturn version a little bit better. For some reason, the controls felt a little more smooth to me. Uh, visually, I feel like the all the video sequences, all the cutscenes and cinematics actually looked a little bit worse in the Saturn version, but the actual gameplay didn't look any worse, and I felt it controlled a little bit better. And that, to me, is the most important aspect, considering you are already encumbered a bit by using the controller rather than the mouse. So the Saturn version with the slightly better controls really worked for me. And I played through the whole thing and beat you know, all of it, and it was a really great sort of nostalgic moment, also using a new experience with the Saturn. So it was a sort of a great combination of the old and the new. And I really enjoyed that port, and it's something I'll play a lot. And it's easier to just throw that into a Saturn than getting it to run on a newer computer or digging out an old computer and doing it, which is something that I intend to do, but at the same time, occasionally, if I just want to play a level or something, not go through a whole playthrough of the game, or play with a friend or something, I'll actually dig out the Saturn version, I think, first. Now, for the Sega CD, Rise of the Dragon is a really great FMV, murder mystery, cyberpunk game, sort of in the vein of Snatcher, if you've played that at all, or have heard about it, or watched like a walkthrough or anything. And I really enjoyed Rise of the Dragon. I think it was also a DOS release. I'm trying to remember. I've only ever seen the Sega CD release, and this is the only one I have here. And I'm really liking it so far. It's something where I expected to enjoy it, but I was a little iffy. I wasn't... It's definitely not as good as something like Snatcher, but it is a very fun game, and I was surprised. I put it in for the first time just to sort of test it out. Whenever I get a game that's used, I always put it in and play for like 10-15 minutes just to sort of test it out, get a feel for the game if it's something I've never experienced before. Uh, I always do that when I get a new game. And I ended up playing for like over an hour without realizing it, put it in another time, played for a couple hours, and really got into it more than I was expecting. I enjoyed the world and the story of it a lot more than I was thinking I would, and the controls are fine, and there are definitely a few issues where you can sort of, in, in the style of a lot of games of that type, put you know, work yourself into a corner if you didn't do something correctly, and you kind of want to have a walkthrough to get through that, and I think it has a few design flaws like that, but overall, a really great experience and far better than I was thinking it was going to be. Now, my last two are both sort of the same topic, where I originally played Unreal Tournament on the PS2, one of my first PS2 games, and when I picked up the Dreamcast version here, 
I was a little bit iffy because it, Dreamcast only has the one analog stick, and playing a really fast-paced action first-person shooter of this style with one analog stick, I was a little worried how well it was going to work, um, and I actually ended up preferring it in a weird way. And it's kind of hard to explain, they actually mapped the other analog stick to the four face buttons, and for some reason, in playing the two, maybe it's just because I prefer the feel of the Dreamcast controller and I'm a little more used to it that I end up liking this better, but if you play around in the menus and look through the options of the different control schemes, you can really configure it in a way where it's not like a keyboard and mouse precise, but I actually ended up liking the Dreamcast configuration more than the PS2 configuration, which is really odd given it's missing an analog stick. And that, to me, was just very surprising. I, that's, I didn't expect that at all. I expected to see it as sort of an inferior version, but I actually liked it better. I think it looks a little bit better, and to me, it runs a little bit better. I mean, in every aspect, the Dreamcast version of Unreal Tournament, for some reason, is a little bit better than the PS2 version. And then on top of it, it's just a personal preference where the fact that the use of just one analog stick didn't really you know, hurt the gameplay at all for me, it became my preferred version really quickly. And in that same vein, Dead or Alive 2 Hardcore was one of the first PS2 games I ever played. When I rented a PS2 from Blockbuster for my birthday before I could afford to get one, I rented a whole bunch of games, and this is one of the ones we got and played this a lot. Uh, didn't play it quite as much that weekend as we might have if we didn't have Tekken Tag Tournament, because that one took precedence, but overall really, really enjoyed it, and I really liked the series. And finally, I was able to play the Dreamcast version. This is the Japanese Dreamcast version of Dead or Alive 2. And it's missing a little bit from Hardcore, but really nothing too important. And overall, I actually prefer this version a lot. Um, one, because I like the Dreamcast controller better. And for me personally, it works better for fighting games than the PS2 controller. I just like it better. And even though some people complain about the D-pad on the Dreamcast controller, I personally like it. And for me, just control-wise, I prefer the Dreamcast version. And I was not expecting to like it better visually, because the Dead or Alive 2 Hardcore adds a few things visually, a uh, little like lens flares, a little more details. Um, sometimes the textures are a little smoother, feel a little more detailed. L little things overall that's not a big difference, but little things are added that are considered an improvement. But overall, I actually feel some of those things, and I did a review talking about Dead or Alive 2 and the difference between the uh, PS2 version and the Dreamcast, and I think a lot of those additions actually took a little bit away from how beautiful the environments and the character models look. And I do think that signature sort of Dreamcast pop that it has, where things have a more rounded edge because of the way the po uh, they did polygons with the Dreamcast versus the PS2, Everything has a little bit more of that rounded edge smoothness, a little bit of a pop, and colors look a little bit better. While the PS2 version looks a little bit more detailed, it looks a little more washed out, and the added lighting effects I actually think take away from the overall visual experience. So something where I got this more because I really like the game, and I wanted to try it out on the Dreamcast, rather than intending to like it better than the PS2 version, and it ended up, again, like Unreal Tournament, that's my preferred version now. And that's a look at just a handful of games that really surprised me, games that I was going into intending to like, but enjoyed them more than I thought. Um, have you guys checked out any of these games, and have you had a similar experience where you picked up something thinking that, I, I think I'm going to enjoy playing this sometime, maybe have it sitting on your shelf, and you finally picked it up and like, holy crap, this is so much better than I thought. Have you had that experience with any games, Sega or otherwise? Uh, let me know below.